Hi, I'm ready. Okay, you talking to me or your fan or your all your fans and friends? All of you. How is how are you guys? How is everyone doing? How are you doing, Les? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, I'm doing. This is a yeah. It's a big year of releases, as you know. So yeah, I'm doing really good. Yeah, there's lots to talk about. Where's everybody from? I'd love to hear on Facebook Live where everyone's from. I'm looking at participants. I, I know where a lot of you are from, but I'd still always love to hear it. Um, this is very much an interactive sort of presentation today. So we're going to be doing a lot of question and answers. So feel free to put all of your questions into the chat and then just get comfortable and we'll pick through them. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get started. So Les, great to have you back. Thanks. Nice to see you again. And I've opened up my chat to the side. Will that help as well? Because I can see what's coming on there. Yeah, great. Um, so I think what's, <clears throat> I mean, you're such an interesting character. And anyone who's listened to the podcast um, that we did already knows just how interesting you are. But I uh, feel- You know what? You know what? I'm going inter to interrupt you, April. I'm scared. Because we're, we're here to talk about my book, right? Yeah. So now I'm, I'm going to throw you totally under the bus and say, you get to tell everybody why I'm so interesting. Well, I run back upstairs and grab my book. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, we were upstairs, but the acoustics didn't work. So look, if you don't know who Les is, he is from Survivor Man. So he is Survivor Man. He was really one of the first, I'm sure he'd cringe if you heard me say this, but like reality TV stars. But the difference with Les is that he never had a crew, right? He was always holding the camera himself. So he's just got a really interesting story. It's way too difficult to, to Put it all here but he's also a musician he's a canadian so of course we love him um but yeah he is his survival stories are really interesting and super authentic and um i would urge you to listen to the episode and he's also just put out a kid's book which is something that we're going to share with you all because as a mom i personally think it's absolutely fascinating so um let's let's just start with um kind of we'll start with the book and then pick away with some other things so tell me what this book is and um and we'll go from there well here it is first of all so as you can see it's called wild outside around the world with survivor man and uh it's funny i keep getting asked you know why the jump to uh something for kids uh but it's not a jump for me at all uh i've spent well the past 40 years of my life in or 30 years anyway 35 years of my life teaching kids uh for 15 years as an outdoor guide you know, every outdoor guide knows what a shoulder season is. And in the shoulder seasons, you tend to uh, say goodbye to the rich tourists and you get school groups. So I've been on uh, thousands, sorry, hundreds of trips with thousands of kids uh, and, and all age groups from five years old on up to just, you know, getting to the, the last year of high school. So for me, teaching kids, working with kids, that was always part of my DNA as an outdoor guide. Now, if you look at all the Survivor Man stuff, and everything I've done, Shark Week and everything else, you know, one of the greatest compliments paid to me is when someone says, I grew up watching your stuff with my dad. You know, I love hearing those stories because all of the work that I did was still family friendly, if you will, and it was still very appropriate for kids. Uh, case in point is, you know, seeing kids dressing up as Survivor Man for Halloween. Right. Now, if that isn't a nod of vindication, I don't know what if. That's when you know you've made it. It's like, wow, that's the coolest thing ever. Literally getting pictures of kids dressed up like me, cardboard cameras and all, you know. <laughs> and so, so really the, the, the concept of me taking everything that I teach uh, and, and speak about connecting to nature uh, combined with outdoor adventure uh, and uh, sure, yes, survival too, but, but basically it's all outdoor adventure to me. Uh, and directing it towards like, right to speaking right to kids. That's not a jump for me at all. It's really just, all, in fact, if anything, it's kind of like an about time. It's about time I did this sort of thing. And Anik Press, when they came in uh, with, and speaking to me about doing this, uh, they were all about me speaking directly to the kids. And I knew they were, they're the best at that. So uh, I had this opportunity rather than kids vicariously you know, loving Survivor Man and that and, and, you know, hanging out with their moms and their dads, watching it on TV or their buddies, or whatever. Uh, and this, by the way, very much so is girls and boys, because I have lots of letters of, you know, the only I didn't really connect with my dad, except when we sat down together to watch your show and stories like that. Uh, so this gave me that opportunity to say, you know, what, I'm not even talking to the adults anymore. Now I'm talking directly to you. And Anik Press was was fantastic at enabling me 
uh, to carve in, to hone my voice for um, uh, speaking directly to kids. You know, I mean, I, I would be saying things like, am I talking above them? No, no, this is good. Okay. Am I talking beneath them? Okay. No. So just learning that, that methodology of my writing, because I've written other books, uh, was wonderful for me. And I will get into the, 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 the details of the book when you ask me, but in any event, um, that's what the book is about. It is, it is all my adventures, you know, and I'll get into the details when you ask me, which you're probably not going to do right now, but I'm gonna let you do it. <laughs> well, I am going to ask you details about the book, but first I just want to know a little bit more about your psychology, especially now with COVID. Um, you, you know, being told you're a totally transparent guy. Do you feel like now more than ever, we really need to be tapping into our, our instinctual roots and understanding survival? Or do you think that that's just a lot of doomsday theory that's out there on the internet? No, I, I, I don't. Oh, yeah, as you know, April, we always speak pretty candid, you and I, when we talk, and, and I don't like to speak any other way. So I suppose the honest answer to you is no, I don't, no, I don't think it's now more than ever. No, I think it's been as vital and as important as it has always been. It doesn't, you know, the, the world circumstances, the pandemics, the, the political unrest, the all different things that go on, to me, have nothing to do, actually, with the necessity to connect to nature. They're just stuff society gets all messy about um, and things that we have to deal with, whether it's a war or a pandemic. Now, to me, the, the concept that connecting to nature is as vital in this very moment as it was 150 years ago and 500 years before that is, is exactly the same. Uh, now, sure, uh, there are, we could argue that societally speaking, there are distractions that are far more potent now than ever, methods of living in cities and urban areas that are much different. But, you know, are they? Are they really? You know, I mean, just watch, you know, I don't know, just watch Monty Python's Holy Grail, and, you know, and, and look at the inner city. I'm, I'm being facetious a little bit, but look at the inner city scenes of a movie about ancient Rome. Does that look very nature oriented to you? It's a bunch of rubble and people dying on the streets. So, so no, I think we've always needed this it's always been vital and what's been heartbreaking for me is the lack of connection uh that that so many people around me than that i know uh experience and kids you know as i said guiding kids you know i used to take inner city kids up on wilderness adventures youth at risk on wilderness adventure and you want to see kids that don't even know what a leaf is you know they don't know the difference between a maple and a birch tree kind of thing that's them so you know, in the end, April, I think, uh, you know, is it more important now? The answer is no. Is it vital? The answer is absolutely and always will be yes. Yeah, excellent. I love that. So I guess my big question right now before again, we dive into chapters is what was the major difference for you writing for children versus adults? Because I mean, survival doesn't discriminate, right? Survival is the same for all of us. So is it just how you delivered the content or delivered the education? Or did you actually have entirely separate um, points in the kids book that, that you would, you know, compared to how you present it to an adult? Absolutely identical. It's the same lessons. It's the same stuff I've been teaching for years to adults. Uh, so in effect, yeah, I really just adjusted the delivery package, uh, which again, Claire Caldwell and Anik Press were brilliant at helping me do that. But, uh, but again, also to, to give myself some credit is the fact that I guided kids for years, uh, you know, uh, to this day, I mean, where I live right now in my American residence down in Southern Oregon, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, two little girls that live beside us and just adore when they come over. And I built two frog ponds and uh, turtle ponds by hand in my yard. They come over and now I've got a moment to talk with the little one about, okay, well, there's a reason why you shouldn't really constantly handle salamanders. Like it's, you know, we can look at them and, and, and we can check out the frogs and the tadpoles, but you know, you gotta know that if you keep picking them up, you're, you're taking valuable stuff off of their skin, you're shock, shocking. So we get these little lessons going on. So I've never stopped teaching kids. I, I love it. I mean, my children are 25 and 23 and I adore them but I sure miss that magic zone of age 2 to 12 to me that 10-year packet is just it's just the most amazing so I miss that so whenever I get the chance to you know hang out with my next door neighbors kids or anybody else like that I take it so uh the book was now so in fact the first 
we call it a galley when you get like a book, your version, but it's not ready for the press yet, but it's just a test pressing called a galley. When I got the very first galley, I gave it away to my next door neighbor's daughters. Uh, and the, the husband, now, now there's so many things we could talk about. So I'll just tangent for just a second. And I wanna, because I've just mentioned him and I wanna point that out, you know, um, one of the harder, more darker questions I got uh, recently in an interview was, what are the um, obstacles to us in reaching kids about getting excited about outdoor adventure? And why I'm mentioning my neighbor um, is because he's not an obstacle. He understood how much fun the kids could have with me over here playing in the, he's right there, playing in the field and digging in the swamps and, and making ponds with me. He understood that. So the obstacle often though, and we can elaborate on this maybe later, but I will say our parents, parents, are, the, the internet is not the biggest obstacle. No. Cell phones are not the biggest obstacle. We are, the adults are the biggest obstacle to kids connecting with nature uh, or understanding how to connect to nature. Uh, sorry, I'm tangenting on you there, but- No, uh, I love it. Well, I was really excited that you wrote a children's book because I was thinking it'd be great for a lot of adults who are very intimidated by it to be able to, I mean, some of the best education I have with various things like there's this excellent kids fly fishing book. I actually learned a lot about fly fishing by reading a kid's book. And I expect it's the same with, with your book. So what is the, I haven't actually seen the chapter list. So what would this chapter list look like? Well, our, so we'll get into the book. And what I'll tell you is that, uh, again, I just will constantly heap praise upon Attic Press and Claire Caldwell because uh, I, I've got the stories. I've got the lessons. I've got the morals of the story. I've got the tricks and techniques and the things we can do at home. I've got the natural history instruction, but they know how kids receive these things in written form. That was the one world that was very new to me. So we looked at it and I'm not often big in the keynote world of, of things like using acronyms and, you know, I get it. I understand it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a first responder, so I know fire, wire, glass, or gas, or glass. I know these things that you rhyme in your head to help you learn things. And that was brought about. So let's, let's look at that. So we came up with, it's, helped, it's quite handily on the back, uh, prepare, observe, react, and adapt. And what this enabled me to do was to frame my story. So there's 12 Survivor Man stories. Not all from Survivor Man. They're Les Stroud stories, really. Yeah. And of those 12 stories, I looked and I said, okay, what are the lessons taught? And some stories I kind of, I threw away because that, well, it's a great story. I didn't really learn anything there. You know, it's just sort of a happening, right? So that's, so what's got lessons involved that are, that are rich. And that's when working with Claire, we realized, well, this story has three lessons, but the strongest lesson is observation, learning to observe nature. Okay. Let's put that one in the observed chapter, right? And so this way we were able to slot about 12 stories into four chapters based on these four headings. And what I'm doing is teaching the child to, well, to prepare before you go on an adventure, to observe everything around you that's going on, to know how to react to a given situation, good or bad. Uh, for example, uh, I've got a wonderful, beautiful story of meeting a Canadian lynx and a scary, scary story of being chased up a tree by a moose. Two different reactions required there. And then lastly, okay, what do you do next? How do we adapt? And that's how we sort of um, made the book work in an exciting way, as I say, for kids with the, that sort of four headings. And once I get into the chapters, that's when I get into my, my actual adventure stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So it's done via storytelling, which is so important. It's funny that you mentioned that about the press and the, and the kids' books. How many people on here have kids? If you have kids, go ahead and just write in the comments how many kids you have in their age, because I'm totally being honest. And some of the children's books out there are absolute rubbish. And I read them and I'm, I'm like, what? How did this get, get an award? I mean, it doesn't even have an ending to it. Um, so I, I think that this is genius. I think that you doing this, not just from a sales stance, but just from a sheer, you know, in-depth knowledge stance, that this is so necessary. Um, yeah. Can, anyway. I, can, I, can I interrupt you? Because you just said yeah. something, not just from a sales stance. You sort of threw that comment out. Look. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know I only look 29 and I know I only act 29, but this is my 60th year. I'm hitting 60 this year. Yeah. So I don't need to do this because I'm survivor man and I'm a, I'm a C celebrity, you know, C list celebrity. 
on TV or anything like that. Uh, I've got 20 years of adventures behind me and a lifetime and 15 years before that of adventures that had nothing to do with filming or production. So there's nothing about this that is a business move for me. Um, you know, you, I don't think you ever, I'm tangenting here, but I don't think you ever lose your searching, your, you, you know, your, for me, I, I, I don't think I ever lose that tendency to go into existential crisis and question what's this all about and why am I doing this? But I'm glad that I do that because even a lot lately realizing, you know, um, maybe taking a little bit more ownership for whatever I have, whatever gifts I've been given because I'm a very lucky man and what I've been, been able to do. Well, in the end, it's always the same mission, whether it's my music uh, or whether it's my filmmaking or whether it's my writing or my speaking, either way, I just, I can't help but be obsessed and passionate about getting people in the out of doors, getting them to connect to nature. So that's what this book is about. Uh, um, you know, like I did with Survivor Man, and the press doesn't want to hear this, but in some ways, I don't care how many copies I sell. I care that one kid out there gets it. And then it changes the life of one kid. That's the way all creators, you have to look at it as a creator. You're a fly fishing ex expert. You're an enthusiast, extraordinaire. But in the end, if all you do is get one child to discover and become alighted by fly fishing, your job has been done. That doesn't mean you stop. I'm just saying that's the goal. Um, so it's never been about business for me and it, and it, and it never will. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about the specifics. So obviously with survival, we've got, you know, shelter, water, foods last on the list, warmth. How do you teach these things to children? Let's start with water because I think that I personally am very interested in, in how to make sure that I'm hydrated out there. So how do you teach children about survival and water without it being terrifying? You know, like you will die in a few days if you don't have water. Well, I think sometimes you just straight. You know, sometimes if you need to say you can only survive for three days without water, you just say it that way. You know, I've raised children. I'm best of friends with my kids. So I'm lucky, total, you know, complete luck, uh, dumbfounded by that. But I, but I am, you know, I, I, and so, but one of the main things I always did with them was I just completely always told them the truth. I was always straight with them. And so no matter what question they're asking me, yes, on occasion, I had to be age specific in terms of the answer, but sooner or later, they were going to get the full answer. They never got, they might've got a part answer or a half answer, but they never got a wrong answer out of me. They never got a fib or a lie out of me. It would just like be for a later time, we'll get into that question, you know, and that's enabled me to re remain their best. Of, well, they're my best friends. So in teaching survival to kids, it's kind of no different. Why, you know, Someone thinking about starving to death or dehydrating to death, that's as, as scary to an adult as it is to a child. Yes. You, know, you know, and I, I alluded earlier to our, our, we're the biggest hurdle for kids. Well, um, the thing is it's our phobias, right? So we all have them, okay? So case in point, mine, mine would be heights. I can't do heights, can't do them. There's certain places, you know, you want me to get, go to that ledge, you'd have to hold a gun to my head and I'd still go, yeah, just, just shoot me. Yeah. I can't, my legs will not move, so pull the trigger. So when I had, my kids were young and we would hike a big trail somewhere and there'd be like an overlooked ledge and it's all safe to go look and everything, I, I couldn't get, I couldn't get to the edge, but I wouldn't, I would just simply back away. And my wife at the time uh, wasn't afraid of heights and they would go and just, dad would just be back. I was gonna stand back here and get a photograph. Meanwhile, I know what I'm doing. But they don't. Now, this is not me lying to them. This is me not exposing my phobia to them too soon. I didn't want them to go, well, dad's afraid of that. We need to be afraid of that. And that's what we do with spiders and snakes and bees and tall grass and you name it. People are like, oh, well, your child sees that, you know. So how do we teach a child? Uh, you know, I, a woman asked me once, uh, I have a three-year-old girl. How do I get her interested in, in nature? And I said, well, do you you know, do you live in a house or an apartment? I live in a house. Do you have a backyard? Do you have grass and some bushes? Yeah, yeah. Well, then just supervised, obviously. Just let your child go out and sit in the mud, not only after it rains, but while it's raining. Let her pull up the grass with her you know, little hands. Let her find a worm and pull it up. It breaks halfway and she cries. Let that happen. 
let them get dirt under their fingernails. So long way of answering you in that even teaching the gnarliest stuff of survival is to be straight with them, just straight and clear. Do you, you you've got a young daughter. And uh, so uh, whether it's now or later, you're gonna be teaching her the fine art of fly fishing. Are so you going started to- this stuff ages. She's, she's a better forager than I am. Right. I swear, so because we started early. But. Did you sugarcoat the fact that the end of a, of, a, of a fish hook is sharp and could hurt her? You showed her, you told her. I'm really bad. I'm like the mom who's like, panic only leads to death. So smarten up. <laughs> My friends roll their eyes with me. But I also think that today's generation is probably a little bit too much of, you know, the helicopter parenting isn't really my personal style to each their own, but, um, but yeah, but they get it, they get it so much earlier, I think, than we give them credit for. And, and it's really helpful because it becomes second nature to them, right? Early. Well, like that, that's the thing. Yeah, nature to kids is second nature. Uh, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, they'll watch a beetle forever. So you can, you know, without giving them a phobia, you can let them know, oh, you might not want to pick that one up. Well, he could give you a little nip, but no, no, keep watching. Oh, you can get really close in there, but just might not want to pick that beetle up. They, they, they give little nips. Oh, what's a nip feel like? Well, you can be your finger. Let me show you. Oh, daddy. That's like a little nip. That's what it kind of might feel like. So just watch him. Let's just watch this beetle. Oh, this guy here, you know, it's kind of harmless to hold this little moth in your hand. Sure. But watch for the wings. There's dust on the wings. You know? So you get to tell and teach all these lessons all the time when you're, you know, reaffirming them. But at their time in nature. But yeah, they're natural. All children are natural naturalists. It's yeah. wonderful. And they're so close to the ground, they don't miss anything. Um, tell me about this book, though, as far as how you explain. So obviously, I haven't read it. And I'm sure you don't just say you need water to survive. Do you tell them how to go and get water? And if so, what does that look like? Well, let me let me walk through, let me walk through, say, a chapter with you and, and just to show you how it's laid out and how it works. And that'll answer your questions, I think, pretty good. And I'm going to turn first to my favorite, my favorite page in the book because it's, it's uh, the illustrator, his name is Andrew P. Barr. And the photographer, her name is Laura Bombier. And to start with, uh, yes, the book is full of illustrations, just like this one. Uh, try and do this with the uh, light. Yeah, there good. Go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, so that is Andrew Barr catching, um, capturing my story of going down a hill in Norway when I became hypothermic. It's just, did, he did it so beautifully. But then over on the other page, there's Laura Bombier's picture of the moment. Cool, this is great. So that's actually, so I was able to, you know, take Laura's photographs and Andrew's illustrations and they play off each other so beautifully in the book. And, and the whole book is like that, uh, you know, like the next one is, the next chapter is when I got chased up a tree by a moose. <laughs> this, is, this is great. It's like comic book style. Awesome. I'm really excited to read this to Adelaide. Oh, abso absolutely. So can I walk through it a little bit with you? Yeah, yeah. Let's see it. Okay. So each chapter starts off with an adventure log. Okay. And the idea with this is think of it like, you know, the explorer's journal, the captain's log, you know, that sort of thing. And I just lay out location, conditions, gear, and mission. So. First, I set the scene for them. Here's where we're going. We're going to be in Norway for this story. And what's the what are the conditions? It's freezing cold. There's a blizzard going. I'm on the top of a mountain in 10 feet of snow. What gear do I have? I've got great clothing and a warm coat. And okay. And what's my mission? I just got to get down to the fjord, which is a couple of miles below, but it's green down there. I'm in 10 feet of snow. I'm going to end up in green. So I like to, so we set each chapter, each story with that log that adventure log, right? And then the next thing we do is kind of like, if you look at this, you see it says prepare. Uh -huh. So uh, it's kind of like, um, you th think of it like a pull quote in a magazine article, except much richer. So in the prepare chapter and the three stories that are in there, I point out what's the highlight lesson here of preparing that this story helps us to learn or a generalized highlight lesson of preparing that we need to learn surrounding this story. So I put that in there. Next up, of course, if you could, this is, this is the one that many parents are going to love, which is, sorry, I gotta, yeah, right. Try this at home. Oh, awesome. So this is great. The, try, the try this at home is, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do something we can do right now at home in your backyard or down at the park, you know, with your parents or without them. Sold. So, <laughs> sold. Um, by the way, Dora the Explorer is going to go to business with this. <laughs> sorry, so, Dora. Uh, 
Well, again, I'll give an example, really simple stuff like go out at night with your parents, take some flashlights and just learn about eye shine. Did you know that spiders eyes shine up at night? And you'll get to recognize like, yep, that's a raccoon over there. See his eyes, see how he's moving. We can learn what's going on in the forest by eye shine. It's how I walk my dogs every night. Oh, oh yeah, that's the dogs. You know, oh, those are deer, you know? And, and so uh, little things that they can do at home or even more grander things at home, making a weather gauge, that sort of thing. Next up, sorry, do you wanna ask any questions? Cause I gotta keep going here. I'm sure a lot of people have questions and I will get to your guys' questions, but right now this is, let's keep going through the book. Okay, I'm almost, yeah, I'll just finish with the chapter roundup. So the other thing is naturally in these kinds of subject matters, you're gonna end up with natural history. And so whether it's Norway or what are antlers, we put in beautiful photographs and natural history that, that are about the story that I just told. So one of the stories, for example, is me uh, bumping into a Canadian lynx. Mm -hmm. This is great. And so naturally that opens up some natural history uh, lessons on, or not lessons, but simply a natural history moment on what, what Canadian links are all about and what they're like. And then finally, at the end of each chapter, mission accomplished with a question mark. And so it's a question mark because I don't always accomplish my missions. I fail, I'm human. We don't always, and so in Norway, the mission was get down to the fjord at the bottom of this mountain where it's, it's raining, but at least it's not freezing cold and 10 feet of snow. That was my mission. Did I accomplish it? Well, kind of, sort of, but I almost died in the, you know, trying. So um, that's how the chapters lay out. Every, every chapter walks through with that. Some of them are double page spreads in the illustrations. Uh, you know, you can hear my passion enthusiasm welling up because I, I, again, uh, I don't know how often authors do this with their publishers, but Anik Press and Claire Caldwell, I mean, they're my heroes now. I don't know if they'll ever do another book with me, but this has convinced me that I'm going to do more books because this one is just brilliant. And, and if I do say so myself, the, but the point is, can your kids read this, hear my voice, the voice of Survivor Man, by the way, eventually I'll be reading each chapter on YouTube, um, and can they be inspired to get connected to nature? some way or another. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's get some questions because I know that um, some people have got some some survival specific questions. <laughs> um, yeah, Kathy would like one for two and a half year old grandson for sure. Uh, um, they'd like to know how to order. Do you wanna do that now while I'm pulling up questions? How can people get the book? Oh, um, you know what? Actually, if, if you don't mind, April, uh, my YouTube channel is Survivor Man Les Stroud. And this afternoon, I actually put, um, because this is, this is launch day, I put up a little YouTube video uh, showing exactly what I just showed you basically. But in the description is a link to all the places in Canada and the US where you can order the book. Oh, fantastic, that's excellent. Amazon. Yeah, right, got it. Yeah. So write your questions, guys. My question, I'm gonna pull up Facebook right now because um, that's usually a different beast over there. Um, is, is about the actual technical skills that are in the book. Do you at any point say you can survive by eating grubs or you can filter your water by doing X, Y, and Z? Like, what, are, what are some takeaways as far as actual skills that they could utilize apart from observing? Well, for example, uh, uh, compass skills. Uh, now, I don't get too uh, academic about it. Because again, this is a primer to get them out and get a compass in their hand. And so in the, in the uh, so I guess the answer is in some ways, yes, because in the, uh, uh, you can do this at home sections. That's where I get to play a little bit with that. There's, a, there's an orienteering uh, project in there that you can do. And then within the stories as well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm a fan, Survivor Man was often like this. I'm a fan of teaching you how to do something without you knowing you just got taught. So the short answer is yes, those skills are in the book, but they're in there because you just read that certain paragraph in that chapter and you, you don't even realize you were just taught how to get some water in a dry situation. Oh, good, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Excellent. Um, Sarah says, I love embracing the suck of outdoor adventure. Freezing and sweating makes the meal by the fire so much more satisfying. It does. She'd like to know, how do we introduce that concept to young kids without making them miserable and making them hate going outdoors with us? Yes, same question. How do we do that? Because I do hear a lot of parents and even people, spouses who are like, oh, my spouse or my child hated being on the boat freezing and they don't want to go anymore. So it's a fine line. How do we navigate that? 
<laughs> you know, uh, first of all, congratulate your your Facebook person there. I actually haven't gotten this question this way before, and I like it because it made my brain go a different place. And you might be surprised of the answer. Uh, the answer. Who's the person that asked the question? First Sarah. name or Sarah. Sarah. So Sarah, you might be surprised at my answer. My answer is this. Don't make them suffer at all. Make them super comfortable. Take care of all the comfort. I go fishing for steelhead on the Rogue River. My boat guy happens to have a heater in the front of the boat. I love him because <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, warming up my fingers. Now I'm back to fishing or it might suck the whole day. So embracing the suck is something we do as we get older. We learn how to embrace the suck because we want to toughen up, right? We want to feel that, that aching thing. Kids don't. And, and your friends don't either. Put it this way. This is something I've said for a long time. Um, you know, I te taught uh, dog sledding and winter camping. Well, uh, I, it, it breaks my heart to hear somebody say, oh, I tried winter camping. It was horrible. And I just think, well, your guide sucked. Because you need to have been taken out there and shown how beautiful it was. And so when I guided people, man, their comfort was everything to me. So no, Sarah, I, I think don't try to toughen up your kids and get them to embrace the suck. Let them find that on their own. Make them, get them the best sleeping bag you can afford and, and tent and, and like, look, when my kids would go camping with me, I used to take their Nalgene bottles, now empty, boil water, fill them with hot water at night and put them in the bottom of their sleeping bags as hot water bottles for them to sleep when we would be tenting. Now you could say you're a survivor, man, your kids be good and tough. Yeah, but I wasn't gonna throw them into it. And, you know, my little six-year-old would fall asleep in a heartbeat, snuggling a, a, a hot water bottle. But it's an algae bottle, not a real hot water bottle, right? Mm -hmm. So don't force anyone to ever embrace the suck. Look at uh, April, is there, do you, if you take me out fly fishing, do you want me to, to throw my fishing rod in the water because I'm so frustrated because I just, I just, you know, uh, uh, you know, or do you want me to slowly be, embrace the beauty of it you're gonna you're gonna baby step me yeah so you have to baby step people in these things i might be you know the whomever of survival but i will tell you survival sucks you know i i'm case in point uh, uh well two things number one being comfortable in the wilderness is an art form and i love that art form so and i know i've answered sarah's question already but i will say that coming up uh, i serve on search and rescue here in oregon uh, and so i'm an instructor but also a volunteer so uh we have a level one test coming up and I don't actually have my official level one. So I'm gonna go for my level one test. We have to climb over a mountain down the other side, sleep in the snow for four hours and, and then go home. We're allowed to have tents and sleeping bags and sleeping pad. In my life, that honestly makes it pretty easy, right? Some of the other guys are like, no, I'm gonna build like a trench shelter, man. And I'm gonna, and I'm like, yeah, I've built so many of those. I'm taking my tent, I'm taking my big sleeping bag, I'm taking my thermo rest because I'm not there to prove anything. I'm there to get up over that mountain. I'm 60, I'm gonna be probably the oldest guy there and women, there are women and men going. I'm gonna be the oldest person there, older than the instructors, everybody, I'm sure of it. They're like, some of these dudes are like 20 something. It's like, oh, whatever. You know, they're gonna go doo -doo 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 up the mountain, right? So long winded answer, but I've never gotten that question before and I'm grateful for it, Sarah, because I think it's really a mistake to try to expect children to be as tough as we are or our friends to be as tough as we are because you know we're into it let them find that toughness on their own yeah that's such a great answer too thank you for that uh, i'm going to take that to, to heart um, on that note with children and age what is a decent age to start off at when when is it just all too much for them to handle or is it never too much for them to handle it's never too much my my uh, daughter was still in diapers in, she was, must've been a year and a half when we did a major sea kayaking trip on the North Shore of Lake Superior. We had the skill and experience to do that. We had her in cloth diapers so we could wash them. We had strands of cloth diapers across the campsites at night, you know, that we have been washing. So um, the, the age is, limit is based only on your experience level, really. How experienced is April Volke at, at fly fishing? right? You could teach anybody. Um, me at, at outdoor adventure and camping, and, and you probably do the same. Um, so sure. But if you're, if you yourself as a parent are, you know, uh, intermediate, you know, be careful there. You gotta, you know, or find the people who do work with, you know, 
I'm a huge uh, <laughs> proponent, if you will, of being instructed by local people. Mm. It's the best way. My videos are great. My books are wonderful. I love touting that. But they're, no, they're never going to be a replacement for the real deal. You, know, you want to read a book on fly fishing or do you want to go learn from April? You want to read a book on survival or get, go hang out with Les Stroud, right? So, so learn, you know, you yourself as a parent, up your skill game. Go learn from local foraging. My new series, Wild Harvest, is all about local foraging. I still go out with local foragers because I'm still not very good at mushrooms. So I'm learning, but that's the way to do it. I've got all the books, you know, so there's no replacement for learning from your local experts, including with your young kids. There will be courses somewhere where they say all ages welcome. We're doing an introductory to canoe camping. Yeah. Do you think it's important that before we take our children out that we have some level of certification, whether it be first aid or even like, I know one of the first things I did was I took infant CPR, which made me feel a lot more comfortable out there. Do you feel like we owe it as responsible parents to have some sort of first aid training? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I'm hesitant because I don't want that to turn people off. Like, well, I don't have time for that. I don't want that. Well, if you don't have time for that, then find the people who are already there. That yeah. comes back to the local experts again. But do I think it's important? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to be the guide, then get the guiding skills. Now, you know, that question, uh, April, is a wonderful tangent question that goes back to the first thing you asked me. And it's this reality of the pandemic right now. We have an explosion of outdoor adventuring going on, uh, you know, camping and fishing and hunting and canoeing and RVing and you name it. And uh, the dark lining to this silver cloud, because I love that people are getting out, um, is that uh, a lot of people are getting out and they don't know what to do out there. You know, when I was a, a, an outdoor guide, I was the guy who gave the poop talk because I was not, it was not awkward for me to say, okay, everybody, I got to tell you guys how to poop in the woods. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how many people go later on. It's like, oh man, I'm so glad you did that because I was really too embarrassed to ask, but next my first time out here. I don't know really, you know, where we're supposed to go. Or so I give that talk. Well, now we have millions of people going, not hundreds of thousands, millions of people going out. They don't know that. They don't know how to go poop in the woods, you know, properly, safely, environmentally. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that thing that's going on with the pandemic and everybody going out, uh, they need instruction. They need to know, don't even get me into the whole point of seeing plastic wrappers thrown on the ground. I don't even understand that part. I mean, I, I, I yeah, I, that part I can't even get. It's like, how could, okay, I understand you might not know how to poop in the woods, but really you don't know not to throw your plastic chocolate bar wrapper in the middle of this Algonquin Park Trail? Really? I don't know. We'll <laughs> wrestle with that on another occasion. Over no, Gossel. It's pretty, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. But it segues me perfectly into one of the, my, my biggest takeaway when I, when I interviewed you for the podcast was I assumed that, you know, back in the day we would be by ourselves out there and we would take, you know, that people want to be alone, surviving, survivor man style. And you very eloquently explained to me that, no, that's not how it was or not how people wanted it to be, that there was community, right? We would survive as communities. Um, and so I think that a takeaway for a lot of people who want to get their kids outside is that this doesn't need to be strong man takes child out or strong woman takes child out, that we can do it in a community forum. We can take, go with friends and other families and do it safely together. To teach survival doesn't mean being alone, does it? No, that's exactly right, April. Uh, you know, uh, surviving is horrible, ugly, painful, terrible. You know, no, no one who's ever actually endured a survival ordeal comes out going, oh, I wish I could go back and make a better A-frame -A shelter. I just want to go home. That's all you really want. So, uh, you know, and in, in, in older times, sometimes uh, being set out on your own in the wilderness was a banishment. You were expected to die. We thrive, not survive, as a community. And, and that, is, that is really key to all of this. Uh, again, you can come back to the comfort thing. Uh, I, I might be that guy who does all this alone stuff. I hate being alone in wilderness. I truly do. I, I, I look at something amazing and beautiful to see. The first thing I want is someone to share it with. That's what I want. It could be my son. It could be my wife. It could be a friend. I want someone to share it with. If I don't have anybody to share it with, with, share it with I'm lonely. And lonely is crushing. Man, I get bored. 
and boredom makes you lonely and both of them crush you together. So yeah, no community is a big thing. And, and, you know, I've got this new special coming out, as you know, April called surviving uh, to shameless plugs all the time here, but uh, surviving disasters with less Strouds coming out on American public television in June. And I'm showing you how to survive natural disasters. Yeah. Cool. Hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, pandemics, blizzards, you name it. One of the biggest lessons I learned in this was the need for community. It's the community approach that actually brings you out of any survival or ordeal, be it urban or be it in the wilderness. This machismo stuff, that's never been what I've been about. Look, as you know, April, Survivor Man held its own for about three and a half years before everybody ripped me off, before everybody started doing what I was doing. And, uh, uh, you know, and they couldn't do what I was doing, but so they just focused on stunts and being machismo and it was nonsense. Even to this day, I was got seven emails to go on a show called First Man Out. I won't go on it because those shows are about competition and survival. Ask any scout leader, any scout leader that's listening right now. When you take your boys and girls out, are they there to compete? Or are they there to learn first aid in the wilderness? They learned how to do shelter. That's collaboration, cooperation. So why, you know, people, some people miss that. I don't know. But yeah, I, that, that was um, a beautiful point to bring up, April, is, is, is that, that you did, that, that survival and experiencing nature, it's about group stuff. So, so you go out, you know, and you got your little kids, you got your know, five-year-olds, you go out with a group of five-year-olds, you know, and, and, and a class. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be aloneness at all. It doesn't have to be survival at all. Totally. I love it. Chris Pond has asked, how far is too far gaining outdoor experience? I have more than a few stories that include I could have died and I've done a lot of research and prep prior to an adventure, yet he still finds himself in sticky situations. He said, we always come out lucky, but I can't always rely on luck and I also can't just stay home scared. So yeah, how far is too far? Or is that a very personal sort of answer? No, no. Too far is too far. <laughs> What's his name? Is it Chris? Chris, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Chris, too far is too far. You know, it's like, like, come on. I mean, I mean, you know, you say you're always getting yourself into situations and you're always going by by luck. Are, really? You think it's just luck? Are you starting to draw on skill sets you've got in you that you're not admitting you have or not allowing yourself to admit that you have? You know, luck, I will say, luck is a component of survival. It's, it's, I know it's nebulous, but luck is a component because sometimes you just get dumb luck. The Dougal Robertson family had a turtle come up to their raft 72 days, I think it was, on the ocean. And every, every time they needed food, a turtle came up to their raft and they caught it. It's like, what's the, what's the odds of that? And other times people, you know, in the, uh, in the jungle, um, yeah, oh, there's a friend of mine too, I can't remember his name, Yasef, Yasef. Uh, he uh, had no luck at all. Everything went wrong. So how far is too far? Well, again, I'm not in this for machismo. So you got to remember why I teach survival. It's facilitation. You know, so I'll go on this for a little bit too. Now I'm tangenting on, on and, and maybe something, something that you and I could talk about, April, but uh, is uh, these things, the things we do out in nature are facilitation. For what? For connecting with nature. They're just ways to get it. Survival to me was not a, uh, an end of, in and of itself. Survival was just something I knew and taught and could film. But what I really wanted was getting you back out in nature. Fly fishing is wonderful. And we get to eat the fish if we're going to, if we're, going, if we're doing catching and we get all that stuff. But in the end, it's you're out in nature again, which does speak by the way, here's, here's a strange answer to Chris's question. How far is too far? When being there has nothing to do with nature anymore. When being there means that nature is nothing more than your backdrop for your exercising. It's your backdrop for your ropes course. It's your backdrop for your expression of machismo. It's your backdrop for trying to save your marriage. It's your back. You have to be in nature sometimes just for nature's sake. Allow it to heal you. Allow it to make you stronger. Allow it to de-stress you. But if you're always focusing and concentrating on some machismo goal or some activity, and this includes fly fishing, and you never just go and sit, you're missing something there. And I want to give a shout out, by the way, uh, uh, non sequitur here. It's uh, Claude says, I started hot tenting this year. Wow, I miss hot tenting. This mountain thing I have to do, I have to stay in a little tiny tent. And I hate, I love hot tenting. Right? Anybody's there? What is thing? I hear this come back. So I did it many years ago. I did it as a dog sledder. It's just winter camping with a canvas tent 
that you pull along in a, in a, in a small sled behind you. You. Oh, we've frozen up. Is he frozen for anyone else too? Let me go to chat. Can you guys, yeah, he's frozen. Okay, <laughs> he's so much energy. <laughs> oh, you're back, you're back. <laughs> oh, I can see you moving, but I can't hear you yet, uh, Les. Perfect, I gotcha, you're back. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. I don't know what happened. So I'm not sure how much I lost there. We were I was talking about hot camp. Hot, dog, hot, dog sled hot. and towing, and then I lost you. Oh, really? Oh, and I was so profound. No, I just <laughs> it's, it's winter camping in a, in a canvas wall tent with a wood stove and you pull it along and comb a tick behind you. Oh, that sounds And amazing. you're freezing again on me. Am I there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, and it's the most amazing, most beautiful experience uh, to be in the middle of the deep winter woods and minus 40 degrees and, you, and you're warm. You're sitting up in a t-shirt playing cards at night. It's, oh. it's amazing. I hear it's got having a big comeback, which I'm thrilled about. Isn't it funny how the more experienced you become, the more comfortable you are with being comfortable. Like I was fishing today. I came off the water to see you, obviously. And someone tied my fly on today. And there was a time when I would never have let that happen. And now, because you're just so comfortable with yourself out there, you, you let it happen. Um, Tom says he's 60. Oh, Tom, happy birthday. He's 68 years old today. He's happy to hear that there are other people um, in their 60s less. Oh my God, you're, old. you're almost 60. Stop it, April. Stop it. <laughs> he said someone to share the outdoors with. He said if he gets nothing else from today, that was everything. Dustin says, um, I teach middle school outdoor ed to 13 and 14 year olds. Would this big book be a useful resource for aiding and teaching survival skills or doing your chapter challenges to kids of that age group? Great question. It's, it's meant for uh, eight to 12, but now I've got parents with kids who are 14 and 15 and the kids are loving it. So I think we approached it in a way where we reached such a broad uh, accessible demographic of language here that um, I, I, you know what, I guess the short answer is yes, I, I think it would work just fine. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm 38 years old, and I'm really interested in reading this book for myself. I don't, I, I think that it's delivered in a way that's, that's friendly on the eyes, and, and, or it's aesthetically pleasing to a younger audience, but I think that we could probably all really find it entertaining and valuable. Well, hey, it also depends on who, you know, on who the recipient is, right? As I said, as an as a outdoor guide, I guided kids who'd done 15 canoe trips. I also guided kids who'd never been outside of the city. So, you know, it all depends on who your audience is. But definitely, I would, I would say if your kids are 15, 14, I see no reason. In fact, funnily enough, I did just send it to a 15-year-old yesterday. So there you go. There you go. All right. Well, we're going to let you get back to life. Does anyone have any questions that you'd like to add into Q&A um, or chat, either or? And I will also check the Facebook to see if there's any. I'm not great with the Facebook Live thing. It's all kind of new to me. So you just have to bear with me here. Uh, but leave me your questions, and we'll be able to... Oh, even my mom's on here. Wow. Uh, the question is, here's from Rodrigo. Hi, mom. Hi, mom. Love you. The question is because at least in my country, so Rodrigo, I don't see, I can't see where he's from, but he looks maybe South American or something. Um, in his country, there are many unpopulated areas and there are areas and there are always volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. Ooh, so that the population is a little more prepared. Yeah, I don't know what the question is, but it sounds like what you're the documentary you're about to do is yeah you know why don't i elaborate on it so so what i've done oh, is oh um, i'm so sorry les he said is it yeah, ever thought um to translate into spanish for spanish-speaking countries ah it is actually a lot of survivor man's uh, was is translated into spanish and is out, it is out there uh i've done lots of distribution of my work uh, over the years to uh i try to dabble in spanish a little bit myself that's the one language next i would love to learn um but uh, so the short answer is yes, there is some out there. Um, I would suggest that this uh, surviving disaster special for American public television is gonna be dubbed in Spanish and made available down there for sure. Fantastic. All right, does anyone else have any questions? And, and if not, Les, I know you are, you're probably the busiest person I know. Is there any way for anyone to reach you? Do you do live events regularly? How can people find you? Right now to, uh, 
to view my work, uh, the strongest place is actually my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud. I'm putting my whole catalog up on there. Uh, I'm on it constantly. Um, my wild heart. So uh, right now to, to view my work. So I'll give the little, sorry guys, but I'll give you the shopping list here. Um, Les Stroud's Wild Harvest is on American public television. It's uh, got almost a 100% coverage in the United States. So it's everywhere on public TV. Just look for it. Wild Harvest. And that is local foraging. So I take you out and I show you, it might be just something as common as a dandelion, or it might be uh, some obscure plant, but I'll show you. I, I, what, what I do is I always get three plants and then I bring them into the kitchen and I give them to a master chef, Paul Rogalski, and he takes them and makes an amazing, just these beautiful sumptuous dishes. And what he does is we kind of figured out. So every time, every time he makes a simple dish that everybody can make, and then he gets a little esoteric and makes some beautiful concoction. Um, so that's going on wild harvest surviving disasters with less Stroud will be out in the spring, American public television again. Um, and uh, my podcast that's out right now is Surviving Life with Les Stroud. And that's on all your podcast channels. Uh, and I'm interviewing, uh, that's, that's a, a broader subject matter. I talk everything about, you know, music, but I basically interview really inspiring people. Um, people, people like April Volke, uh, which we haven't done yet. So you owe me one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I interview people that are interesting and inspiring people who inspire me. I'm really, you know, big on just, when you hear those stories, it, it puts a little, you know, giddy up in your butt sort of thing. And then um, my music uh, always coming out. Also YouTube. So again, YouTube's the best place. I'm on all the social media platforms and the normal thing, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that's, that's all happening. There. Are you Easy trying to, to figure out Instagram when I was at your place? You're like, how does, <laughs> oh, man. and now I look at you and I'm like, this media genius, he's got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now I'm like going, oh, don't tell me I have to do TikTok next. Oh, oh yeah, right. Oh, I'd pay to see that. Because um, Tom, yeah. Tom, Tom says he's a little out of the loop. What are you doing these days? How can you access it? So I hope that that answers. I, I yeah, and I would say if they, if they want to access me, uh, I mean, business contacts only in this respect, but my website is lestroud.ca and there's a business contact on there. But as far as somebody wants me for speaking and stuff like that, there's the contacts there on my website. Perfect. A few more questions have just come in. Kathy would like to know, and Kathy's so keen to buy your book Kathy I love you Kathy says I would love uh, I would like to know what the best fire starting material is in your opinion best fire starting material wow I could the, the answer always these, a question like this is always well what are the variables where right because variables is a big part of it but I will say you know it's it's kind of cliche but that whole cotton ball with wax mixed in it. I mean, it really does work well, I will say. Vaseline is so good. <laughs> oh, I mean, and then I get asked a lot, what's my favorite way to, to start a fire? Oh, that's easy, a blue, butane torch. <laughs> like the, <laughs> they, they think, people come over to my place and where I'm, I'm gonna have an outside fire. I, I'm, I know they think I'm gonna get down and do the fire bow. And then I, I pull out like a, a dribble of kerosene and a match. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, and I can see their hearts breaking. And <laughs> I like, yeah, I've done enough fire bows. Just, give me that fire log, starter log. I've got fire starter logs upstairs right now for the fireplace. It's like, I've done the rubbing two sticks to thing together a thousand times. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> so to me, the best fire is a fast fire. Gotcha. Um, Phil says, Les, have you spent any time in the Boundary Waters in Montana? And if so, I, I think MN is Montana or is that Minnesota? Minnesota. Um, I've been there almost. I've been on the Canadian side of them and stunning, beautiful. I mean, that the epitome of canoeing and canoe country is that swath from about the boundary, boundary waters, kind of like this, and you go like uh, through Tomogamy, Ontario, which I think is the diamond of all canoeing, and, and then into Northern Quebec and down, and there's this swath, and that's the Voyager canoe trade. That's late, millions of lakes all attached by rivers and portages, you know, because once you get out to the prairies, it's, it stops. You know, you get up to the Arctic, it becomes muskeg. You go down south, uh, the lake systems change and things get bigger. Uh, so that area and the Boundary Waters are just beautiful. Sounds like it. Um, Jonathan asks, do you have a good video on putting together a bug out bag? I, a bug out bag. Uh, I do and I don't. What I do have on, first of all, on YouTube, and you, since you've asked this question, I know you'll love this. On YouTube, you go, by the way, if anybody's not familiar with YouTube and they're, they're going to go, the key are the playlists. Playlists are always the key for good YouTube viewing and where you see everything. So go to my YouTube, 
go to the playlist that says masterclass. And I do a full, I sit down at my kitchen table and I pick apart about uh, four or five um, survival kits, survival packages. And that's very specific to survival kits, kind of outdoor adventuring survival kits. The bug out bag is going to be available when I launch my Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud documentary, because as an add-on, there's going to be online and a book and everything that where I can get far more detailed than I can in the 90 minute special uh, that will that will teach about the bug out bag. How exciting. Okay. Um, there's just a few questions. They keep rolling in. Sorry. No worries. Someone is in, yeah, is Wild Harvest available online? They, uh, Claude's in Canada and doesn't have regular TV. So uh, in Canada, it will be available online almost imminently. In fact, if I wasn't talking to April right now, I'd probably be at my kitchen table uploading the shows. That's how close I am to getting it on. Um, and so it'll be all, the, all, online. I'm also talking to a network in Canada as well that's interested in airing them, but it'll be non-exclusive. So I'll get everything up online, uh, but I, and I'll be putting all sorts of pieces, uh, uh, clips from it as well. Stuff that didn't make it in the shows will be on there. Um, some plants that we decided, you know, we didn't use, but we still filmed it, stuff like that. So uh, for the Canadians, yes, Wild Harvest, uh, thank you for being patient. Uh, it's uh, right around the corner. Yeah, they take time. They take time. You know, and I'll just say, guys, the best thing you can do for me, and I sound like I'm hawking stuff now, but if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you don't get inundated or bothered with anything. You just get a notice when I put up a new video. Simple as that. Yeah, it's definitely worthwhile. Colin has a question that we did cover a little bit, but this is much more direct. Um, he says, with the pandemic, we have lots of new people out camping. They litter everywhere and ruin the beautiful outdoors. How would you deal with these people? And before you answer, I'm going to preface that by saying I had a meeting with New Zealand Tourism and they were saying that the, the tourism that and all the, the toilet paper and stuff that's left outside is honestly making them seriously think about limiting tourism. It's a really big deal. So how do we personally handle those people without getting into a fight? It's a real tough one, isn't it? It's a real tough one. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is Alan Alda, and he always asks these little quick, fast questions at the end of his podcast. And one of the questions is, you know, how do you, how do you deal with um, someone who won't shut up? Okay. You know, and so, but similar, right? It's an awkward situation, and you're in the know. So, and that's it. You're in the know in that situation that this person should stop talking. Uh, but how do you deal with that? You're in the know in that these people should not pollute out in nature. Uh, if you can tell by the tone of my voice and, and that I'm where I've shifted here is because it is a big sigh for me. I'm just like, yeah, how, how do we get people to understand this? I could, I could throw out an answer and say education, but, um, I think I, I took this to heart a little while ago and I was thinking, what are the practical ways though? I, well, you know, uh, people need jobs, people need work, uh, and, what, you know, why not with this, we weren't expecting this. So why not at the head of every, at least, at least at the places like national parks where there are trails and there are rules and there are parking lots, at least in those places, I'm not talking about the obscure, tra obscure trails, at least there, why not have an intern that's hired for the season who simply greets everybody with a wonderful smile and lets them know about not polluting and where the outhouses might be if there are any. And, you know, uh, you know, hands them a pamphlet if maybe if necessary on certain things. So that might be one way of doing it, actually hiring an intern to do something like that. Uh, then there's when I go, I go, I hike constantly. And all I ever see is put out your fire, put out your fire, put out your fire. We, you, you, they're so ubiquitous, you don't notice them anymore. They're Smokey the Bear again, right? But why not upgrade that and put on those trailhead boards something that is eye grabbing that actually gives just a just a couple of basic solid points about you know uh plastic and stuff like that i mean put up a picture of a of a raccoon choking to death on some plastic bag around his head or something like that whatever it takes you know, it's a hard one man because um i'm not um yeah i i, I yeah it's a hard one because I, I i don't like awkward i don't no no that's not what i want to say what i'll say is i i don't like uh sugarcoating that stuff. And um, that is the dark lining of this, this wonderful opportunity of people exploring Yosemite and Glacier National Park and Montana and all these places. But uh, it is that is that, you know, they don't know how to do it. We need to show them. We need to show by experience. I think people think that toilet paper just disintegrates and it does, but not as quickly as people assume. That you know how long toilet paper takes to disintegrate? You tell. Three years out in the open. 
It's not one year. Everybody thought it was over the winter time, even if in place of snow, three years. Wow. So, so, you know, and then it depends what type of toilet paper, what's in that toilet paper, you know, and that's, you know, so it's, yeah, it's a tough one. Like I said, I was the, gave the poop talk when I was the guide and I did it with a smile and a chuckle. These were outdoor keeners who wanted to know they're on the Nahani river in the Northwest territories, of course, the territories, of course, they want to know how to properly poop in the woods, but what's going on right now is not that. And, you know, I, 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 I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer because I'm struggling with it myself. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, there are a lot of questions. So I'm just going to fly through some of these and put them together. Kiernan has one question and Andrew has another that, that complement each other. So Kiernan says, what is your favorite place to go camping or exploring? And Andrew says, what is the next trip or exploration that you're excited about? Uh, so, so my favorite place to go camping or exploring mm -hmm. and the next place and, I'm excited. And about. the next place you're excited to go. You know, we, we certainly are, not victims of, but but accustomed to our familiarity. And I guess once a Canadian Northern boy, always a, a Northern Canadian boy, um, it's probably still Tomogamy, Ontario. If uh, And fishing, April, oh my gosh, is fantastic fishing. Just north of there, ways north of there is another place called Wabakimi Provincial Park. These two places, um, they actually answer the question at the same time because I'm uh, setting up a canoe trip for this summer up in uh, Wabakimi Provincial Park. Um, that, by the way, for anybody who knows my back catalog, I did my very first documentary is called Snowshoes in Solitude. And it was about a year spent living in the wild. And I did that up in Wabakimi Provincial Park. Oh, cool. So I, I haven't camped back there in, in, I'm not, I think even since then, but it's been years. So um, going up there this summer, uh, I, I, I gotta say, I've traveled the world. And I, this is not blowing smoke at all, but North America, man, we have the most kick-ass best nature there is. It, you just, you can't, I mean, the Utah Canyon lands, you know, the high Canadian Arctic, you just can't argue with what we have in North America. I've, I've seen places people rave about, I go there and I go, eh, it's okay. It's not the Adirondacks. You know, like it just goes on and on. North America's stunning. So I do, I love it, but it, it, they didn't ask this question, but I'll say the one place I haven't been, uh, I've been to the foothills, but I've never been to the Himalayan mountains in, in Tibet. I want to go there. I still want to do that. Okay. Um, are you able to upload new links to YouTube for your pilots of Stranded Summer and Winter? Um, Dustin really misses the originals. They're up there right now. There you go. You got to subscribe to my YouTube channel and go to the playlists. I'm telling you, there are hundreds of videos and more going up every single week. So if you look at anything I've ever done, it's pretty much there. By the way, there's also, I also came out last year with my 20th anniversary film package. Every film I've ever done, 76 films in a beautiful, big, it's other DVDs, it's hard copy DVDs, 76 films, everything I've ever done in my 20th anniversary package. That came out last year and it's available. Cool, all right, um, Claudine, what lightweight bear protection do you recommend when fly fishing? Spray, I like, I like the spray. I still have never had the opportunity to use it. I've used it in the air just to see, so I don't know. Um, uh, bangers, the little lightweight, but the, the ones you can just, you can use just in your hands that you don't need a shotgun for. Uh, bangers and spray. That said, the real answer, and, and April, you, you, you fish in bear territory all the time, is knowledge of how bears are, mm -hmm. how they react. If you, if, you go, if you go right now, I did a series with National Geographic called Alaska Grizzly Gauntlet. It's on Disney Plus right now on the Nat Geo channel. Go down to exploration, I think, and it's on there, Alaska's Grizzly Gauntlet. You'll see me get within six feet of a 300 pound Kodiak grizzly. If you know how to be around these animals, that's the best deterrent ever. You'll never need your spray. You'll never need your bear bangers. You'll, you'll, instead, you'll enjoy the experience, which by the way, there's stuff like that in this book. You know, that's why I tell the story of bumping into a Canadian lynx. Now I could say that story and think, oh my gosh, what happened? It was beautiful. That's yeah. what happened. It was beautiful. I mean, more the end of that story, by the way, is also spoiler alert, is uh, it actually came up and sniffed me. Oh, cool. So, so if you know how to be around bears, that's your best deterrent. So read Stephen Herrero's uh, Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidances. So good. It's, it's, it's that's such good. a great book and, and, and study bears. And, and, then, and then you'll feel much more confident and comfortable. 
totally. Prevention is key. Wild Harvest Cookbook available yet from Bob. Yes, Bob. You know what? Hot off the presses, so to speak. I just okayed the final artwork on it last, uh, last night. Uh, it's going to come out digitally uh, within a month and hard copy shortly after that. So the short answer, Bob, is yes. And we're thrilled to get that out. And then we start filming season two in about five weeks. Oh my God, you're so busy. Soren, what is your driving force um, to help your mind stay positive in extreme situations? Often it's just one thing. There are a lot of things that motivate you to survive an extreme situation. Anger can be one. You wanna get, go kill the guy who put you there. Uh, love, you missed your loved ones. You know, you, 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 you're gonna get home to them. That's a key one for me is who am I coming home to? Or because I was filming a lot of times, it was who am I doing this for? So I think um, that, is a, that is a big motivating force is to have that, that voice in your head of, of, of the, the person that you need to get back for, or the reason, it doesn't have to be a person. Maybe there's a big, a larger reason, something you need to do, you didn't do, you know? And these, these more emotional motivations are key, absolutely key, because phys the physical side of it's gonna suck no matter what, so. so true, I podcast with Keith McCafferty from Field and Stream, and I said, what do you think is the most important survival tool? He said, a photo of your family. When you go in the bush, have a photo of your family. So, so true. Um, I think this is our, probably our last question I'm going to ask because the time you've been very generous. Thank you. Okay. Rodrigo has another great question. And because I've been to South America, I feel the fear. I'm going to ask this. What reaction do you recommend for a close encounter with a cougar? Do you run, walk backwards, scream, look bigger? I always thought you might use bear spray, but then I heard that they've got a different membrane on their eyes. Like how, how do you handle a cougar or is it still prevention? They're well, harder to uh, spot than bears, right? It's like you spot them when it's too late. Well, I had it happen. So uh, not too long ago, uh, I was jogging up uh, the hill right where I am right now. Oh, you're in cougar country, big time by your place. Big time cougar country. So, and I run the hill every single day. And I was running up the hill. I was 200 yards from my house. And I scared up some deer. I always scare up some deer, right? And they go, tut, tut, tut. They, you know, off they go and I see the tail. Uh, oh, I scared up a deer. But then I noticed in my head, my ear, the deer's running with me. Yeah. <laughs> and so something went, that's not right. And so I stopped and I turned. And this story's not in the book. It might be in the next one. And standing there and with like a, a paw out and a paw back and looking like this, the head down, looking at me like a beautiful National Geographic photograph pristine, no mange, was about a 130, 140 pound cougar. So he, she, not sure which, I think it was a she, uh, was clearly stalking me. And she's now 15 feet from me. Maybe not even that, maybe it was more like about 10 or 12 feet. Right there, and I'm still looking right at her. Beautiful. I wished I'd had a cell phone or camera or something ready. For about a few seconds, I, I took it in. I just went, whoa. But, and here's those on, on dealing with them, but you can only let that go for so long because they're curious too. And for a while, this cougar thought I was prey. I shocked it too by turning around and standing. Now, I'm not a huge guy, but I'm also not a, a, a 70 pound uh, 10 year old either. That said, cougars can bring down a horse, they've done it. So, uh, at that moment, what I did was I, I liken what you do in dealing with cougar in the same way you deal with a, um, a black bear. Uh, and it's particularly a curi overly curious or a bit of a rogue black, black bear. You get big, you get scary, you, you seem overpowering, you get noisy and you scare them away. And I just went, yeah, like that. It was really loud, just like that, right? And she took off like a shot, right? Didn't want any part of me. Now, I'm ca cautious when I tell these stories because I am aware that attacks have happened. And I am aware that, that even though their favorite prey is under 70 pounds, they've also killed larger dogs and taken down horse. So I am aware of that. But it's, it's the same with the bear question, guys, is the more you know about them, the more comfortable you get and realize they don't really want us. The only animals, don't go for a second there. I, I wrote a book um, 
I, I wrote a manual on survival called Survive. And in it, I talk about this whole thing. And the only animals I believe that truly want us, with the exception of, of, of animals that are injured or sickly, or, you know, uh, um, they've gone rogue. A black bear that goes rogue is a very dangerous creature. You know, a cougar that's desperate, you know, it can be a dangerous cougar. But that's, you know, th those encounters are very, very rare. So the only animals that really want us are maybe polar bears, great white sharks, saltwater yeah. crocodiles. Um, Bengal tigers, you know, these creatures that might actually stalk us, but a black bear, they don't want us. Grizzly bears, they don't want us. Cougars, they don't want us. So again, I don't deny that the odd attack happens, but if you look at all the stats on that, it's so exceedingly rare. Um, I would not say to make it laughable because that's cruel, but, but it's exceedingly rare enough to know that you gain some confidence and knowledge and you're, you're fine in all those territories. Um, it's not going to stop me from going out and running again tomorrow. Perfect. No, that's great. All right, we'll wrap it up. Um, Claude just ordered your book and Stephen Herrero's bear book. You won't be disappointed, Claude. They're awesome. Um, and then I will just make sure, because I hate leaving anyone out, I think we're caught up. Well, this is exciting. Look, you have got so much going on. Um, I love that we can find a lot of your stuff on social, on YouTube. If you're on Facebook Live, you'll notice that I posted a link. We are also launching something amazing on the 29th. Go ahead and put your name on the wait list. Um, it's not a less Stroud survival class, but we have a Tom Brown. Do you know Tom Brown? Oh yeah, Tom Brown the third says hello. Ah, okay, absolutely. He just filmed our master class, and and we do some work with him. He's great. But if you're looking for just an abundance of knowledge, it sounds like your YouTube channel is where. Do you post like your upcoming events and books and like links where people can buy? I do absolutely, yeah. It's all all my social media. Just find me. Definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel and. Uh, yeah, I feel inclined to say this. Uh, just, just be forewarned, guys, that I'm not a one-trick pony. You know, I do a lot of things in my life, and so yes, there's lots of survival on that on that YouTube and on my sites. And yes, there's Survivor Man Bigfoot there too. And there's my music. Yeah, and I there's know. Right, right. He's that was one. Of the, excuse me, one of the most surprising things about you for me was your music. Well, and I and I've got the new big double album coming out this year, vinyl double vinyl album circa the early 70s just fold out artwork everything right so so that's it's just that thing is you know we you know i i'm a i like being an artist i like being a prolific creator that's my goal is to continue as such and and it's the it's the my love of nature love of what's out that window there that that um that drives my artistic creation you know 80 90 95 percent of the time so uh but it's all there yeah they can come and so everybody your listeners and by the way let's do i'm gonna hold you on this now is is really i i that's what we should do i need to come up there you can i i suck at fly fishing i get snickered at all i've caught fish but i suck at it so we, you we can, can you can, well you can come that? to my cabin on the bulkley we'll fix that that's what i'm saying and then i'm going to interview you deal it's a date well thank you so much for coming on to the show thank you for all of you for showing up and asking such wonderful questions and les i look forward to also getting my hands on that book i can't wait to read it to adelaide oh thank you so much yeah i'm you know i'll put it up one more time for everybody that's my new children's book, Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man. Uh, it's focused on eight to 12 year olds, but it's good right up to 16, I'm sure. And 60. Like 38, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, Les. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.